Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the fifth chapter. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The Gospel of the Lord. By a show of hands, how many adults also want a children's bulletin to be playing? Being a I kind of want to. If you want to be a disciple, Jesus sets a lofty standard here at the end of Matthew 5. Be perfect. That's it. Be perfect. I'm the third of four children. And psychologists who study birth order will tell you that as the third child, my personality may be more geared toward being a people pleaser or a peacemaker. However, since my next oldest sibling, my sister, is six years older than I am and my brother less than two years younger, I'm also considered a gap child. That is, because of the difference in age between me and my sister, these psychologists will tell you that I will also take on the characteristics of a firstborn. Structured, reliable, cautious, controlling, achiever. Of course, birth order isn't prescriptive. It isn't destiny. It doesn't determine who we will be. Instead, it's more of an observation and a description of what characteristics children tend to take on, given their order of birth. For me, the drive to be Achiever, structured, and controlling, if you ask my wife, cautious and reliable, people pleaser and peacemaker, shapes many of the decisions I make and how I view myself and others, of course, in the world. But it's not just birth order, right? Our world is constantly telling us what perfection looks like. Images all around us tell us what the perfect person is, tall, thin, and athletic. The perfect person makes lots of money and has a nice house and nice cars. The perfect person has large groups of friends and is busy socializing and partying and meeting new people. The perfect person has the perfect spouse and the perfect children. We're constantly bombarded by these messages, telling us that we're not good enough, not perfect enough. So thanks, Jesus. In a world that tells us we're not good enough, what we really needed was a simple command from the Son of God, like, be perfect. It would be so easy to hear these words from Jesus and once again feel like we're coming up short. But that's not what Jesus has in mind. And Jesus isn't telling us to be perfect in some idealized, fantastic sense. Jesus is calling us to be perfect in our discipleship. Whether you're reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, Jesus is always headed toward the cross. The cross is the place where Jesus will lay down his life for the sake of the whole world. The cross is the place where Jesus will fully confront the powers of sin and brokenness in our world and bear them into death with him. The cross is where the powers of sin and death are defeated. But sin and brokenness will not go quietly. That their power over our lives may be broken, but not destroyed. We are still sinful and broken people living in a sinful and broken world. Disciples will bear Christ to that world. 
After Jesus is raised from the dead and about to ascend, here in, Ma in Matthew, Jesus will give the disciples what we call the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations. That's where all of this is headed. Jesus sends the disciples into the world to be the hands and the feet of Christ, sharing the good news of what God has done in Christ and serving all those whom God loves. But the way of Christ is not the way of the world. And Jesus wants the disciples and us sitting here today to know that the road of discipleship is not always an easy one. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now that's what I'm talking about. Revenge. Somebody cuts you off in traffic, cut them off back. If somebody offends you, offend them back. Someone takes something that's yours, just steal something back. But I say to you, do not resist the evildoer. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, give the other also. If someone wants to sue you for your coat, give them your cloak. If some give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse those who want to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Sounds about right in our world. Global terrorism, people who look differently than us, talking heads on shouting at each other on 24-hour news channels. All you have to do is scroll down your Facebook feed or the leader telegram online and start looking at the comments section to see plenty of enemy hating. And you know where it's the worst, honestly? A group I'm in on Facebook that's all clergy. No kidding. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies. Love those who disagree with you. Love those who do terrible things. Love those whom we are told to hate. I wonder, truly, how Jesus might, inf might frame these dis instructions for his disciples today. You have heard that it was said, build a wall. You have heard that it was said, stop the flow of refugees. You have heard that it was said, Send ICE agents to undocumented workers. Now Jesus isn't telling us to be pushovers. And Jesus isn't saying, open the doors and let dangerous people into your lives. Jesus isn't telling us to put our families at unnecessary risk of danger. Jesus isn't telling us to walk blindly through this world, ignoring real threats to our life. In fact, Jesus wants us to keep our eyes open See the sin and the brokenness of this world for what it really is. Name it that and bear Christ. Jesus turns our worldview on its head. Where the world and broken human nature tell us to take revenge on others, Jesus says meet them with love. Where the world and our broken human nature tell us to destroy our enemies, Jesus tells us to love them. And don't be mistaken, this isn't fuzzy or emotional love. The path of discipleship to be is to be on the move. Love as a disciple is a verb. It's something you do, not just something you feel. And now I am also not naive, and disciples of Jesus can certainly respectfully disagree. And I'm not suggesting that being a disciple means the solution to global war and violence is to swing wide the doors of Ellis Island. That's a political problem. The religious one. The question we have as disciples, the one we're faced with, is how do we show love to those fleeing violence and war? How do we show love to those who cross borders to find work and a better life? What does it look like to give to those who beg from us? And as disciples of Jesus living in this world, how do we also love our leaders? and hold them accountable to work on behalf of all people. To live as Jesus calls us, to live as the redeemed people of God, is not to hide from difficult questions, but to face them head on. And in doing so, like Jesus at the cross, the powers of sin and brokenness will fight back. Their power is already defeated. Jesus stands victorious as the redeemer of all creation. So you and I are invited to share in that redemption and be bearers of good news to this world. 
starting right in the corner of our world, in our homes, among our families, at our jobs, and in our community. So be perfect. Amen.